Good morning, everyone. I'm Doug Conrad, Executive Director of the U.S. Association for Energy Economics. We want to thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Analyzing Potential Federal Restrictions on Permian Basin Oil Production. We're grateful to our speaker, Garrett Golding, Business Economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. USAEE provides a forum for the exchange of ideas, issues, and experience for professionals interested in energy economics. The organization produces professional journals, a newsletter, and holds conferences and virtual presentations, and a host of other products and services found on our website, usaee.org. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website for future viewing. If you have questions, please click the Q&A at the bottom of your window. Questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator today, Michael Plant, Senior Research Economist and Advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Michael. Good morning, everyone. Thanks again for joining us today. So as Doug mentioned, my name is Michael Plant. I'm an economist with the, the Energy Group at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. I'll be moderating uh, today's webinar. So our speaker today is Garrett Golding, a business economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Garrett has been with the bank since 2019. Before coming to the bank, he worked at Pioneer Natural Resources and also had experience working at Rapid Ann Energy Group and as a staff member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. At the bank, Garrett does a variety of work for the energy group, including giving policy briefings to our president, Mr. Robert Kaplan, helping construct our global oil market supply demand balances and writing articles for Dallas Fed Economics, the Dallas Fed blog series. So today Garrett will talk about one of those articles which analyzed potential federal restrictions on Permian Basin oil production. Expect the presentation to run about 20 minutes, maybe a little bit longer. And as Doug mentioned, there'll be a Q&A session at the, after the end of the presentation. Garrett, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Mike. Let me pull up our um, slides here. And um, as Mike mentioned, this was a, um, um, an article my colleague and I, Kanal Patel, wrote for our blog uh, beginning of March. And the work for this kind of was done throughout the course of February. So we've tried to update some of the figures and, and, and everything in here and other conversations we've had since then um, uh, you know, to reflect you know, more current um, information. So. Um, just a disclaimer up front, this presentation uh, does not necessarily reflect the view of the Dallas Fed or the Federal Reserve System. This is that of the authors, and the same applies for any commentary today between myself or um, Mike. Um, so as, as um, Mike mentioned, um, if you're not familiar with, with our group and, uh, and what we do, uh, there's about 40 economists at the Dallas Fed. Uh, doing a variety of work across, um, uh, you know, the region, um, the international, national economy, and we have a energy focus group here, which is unique among the regional banks. Uh, as Mike said, our blog, Dallas Fed Economics, uh, please check it out if you have uh, some time or subscribe. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff, good short research notes that come out um, weekly or, or a couple of times a week. And a lot of our energy work is featured there as well. If you're not, if you're in the oil and gas sector and are not participating in the Dallas Fed Energy Review, uh, please reach out to Mike because um, that is something that is very valuable to us, and we would love to have your input to that work going forward. Um, so you know, to set the table here um, of why we did this, obviously we are an apolitical organization, and and this this work was not any way of evaluating the the uh, you know, the merits of any policy, we just tried to look at how uh, this impacts our, our district. And so our focus here was just on the Permian Basin. And what we tried to, to you know, to set the stage on, um, you know, kind of creating a pyramid of how we get down to where this impacts us. We looked at what the Biden administration priorities were coming in in, in January. And uh, we really see three different main areas of, of, of focus. Uh, first is to achieve a carbon-free power grid by 2035 through a variety of measures uh, by, by uh, federal regulation um, and also through um, a, a pretty significant um, uh, investment in uh, R&D spending and other uh, ways of rolling out uh, clean energy technologies. That's obviously not the focus of, of what we're doing today, 
but it's something that we're watching very closely and how it impacts uh, the state of Texas and the different industries that are here that are participating in this. Uh, second uh, order of priority as, as we see it is uh, cutting emissions from the oil and gas sector, uh, which is the focus of what we're doing um, in, in this report. And the first stage of that, uh, which we'll get into here in a moment, was reviewing uh, federal and oil gas uh, leasing policy. Um, and you know, there was a pause in permitting as well. Um, there's um, going to be, we expect some significant changes to how uh, leasing and permitting uh, are treated at the, in the federal level going forward. Uh, a lot of that remains to be known and remains to be um, really rolled out at, the, at this point. This will take months uh, for some of these regulations to be promulgated, and we'll be watching those very closely. Um, the other main uh, feature that we, we expect is, is a, a very significant drive for uh, clean energy and transportation, and that, that will take a, in the form of a variety of federal government initiatives through either CAFE standards uh, for um, new model year vehicles throughout the end of this decade, and uh, trying to accelerate what states have done on their own um, over the last several years. Um, so, you know, to get into, um, sorry, um, the oil and gas side of uh, federal regulation, this is primarily an offshore game. Um, and it, there's, but even though 25% of U.S. production, more or less, uh, is coming out of federal and tribal leases, about 1.7 of that is, is the Gulf of Mexico. So it, it's, it's a, you know, they are the dominant force here. Um, even though the target of our um, study here was on the Permian Basin and uh, trying to look under the hood of what uh, some of these policies mean. Um, th this is pr primarily a, a Gulf of Mexico issue and we expect some similar results to what we found uh, for the Permian uh, to, to play out similarly with uh, Gulf of Mexico. Um, Native American uh, leases uh, uh, produce a, the smallest out of this batch. Um, they were excluded from uh, these, uh, uh, some of these announcements recently, and we'll, we'll get into the reasons for that here shortly. Um, there's a significant regulatory burden that must be bet, met with uh, leases and drilling uh, on uh, federal government property that doesn't exist um, on uh, state and private um, uh, uh, lands where there are those own lo local uh, regulations and laws that, that, that govern hydraulic fracturing and drilling and whatnot. Um, leases on the federal government are, can, are offered on a quarterly basis. Um, and uh, th that has you know, been significant over the last couple of years as companies stockpiled uh, permits and drilling rights in anticipation of, of, of a potential change in, in administration. Uh, starting in 2021, and that gets directly to the heart of what uh, we're going to get into uh, here in a moment. So in the lower 48, um, royalties and bonus bids are split 50-50 between the federal government uh, and, and, uh, the, the federal, and the states where the drilling is taking place, and that has a significant impact in some states where federal acreage is uh, much more prevalent than in others. So what exactly was put forward here uh, recently? Uh, this has been kind of mishmashed, I think, in a lot of the media coverage, um, especially when it was happening, is all kind of one thing. It was actually two very separate proposals that were announced. The first was a pause on all federal oil and gas uh, lease uh, uh, permitting for 60 days. Uh, that has expired. Um, that uh, also initially included uh, permits on uh, uh, Native American lands. Uh, that was later rescinded. This 60-day uh, permitting pause has since been lifted, and as we understand, uh, permits are are being granted, um, you know, on um, on existing leases and new new drill leases as well. Um, the other uh, announcement that was made in January was an executive order uh, putting an indefinite pause on all federal oil and gas and all fossil fuel leasing, and this is uh, th these leases are being paused until there has been a government-wide review of, of leasing policy going forward. We don't know what the outcome of that will be yet, um, but so far they're still in a um, you know, public comment period on this, uh, holding public forums. And we expect there to be an initial report sometime early this summer. Um, and it, it remains to be known what exactly will, uh, will happen with uh, uh, leases going forward. But that was a, a pretty significant input into our uh, study here, and we'll, we'll show that in a minute. So 
starting to take a big picture look at, uh, at, at shale and narrowing, down the, narrowing this down to the, the federal government's orbit. Um, the Permian Basin has led the way here uh, for the last several years since, since the big downturn, price downturn in 2015. Uh, it was the only basin that did not suffer declines uh, during that initial period. And even though we've kind of potentially hit a top here and, um, and uh, you know, a, a much slower um, uh, increases annually in the Permian Basin, it is still by far the most productive and um, um, most important shale basin in the US. Um, coming down to what the Permian uh, looks like, it's entirely within uh, our district, which is why it was the focus of our study. Uh, and there are uh, three basins here, but really two that are the, the biggest focus of shale operators, the Midland and Delaware Basin. Delaware straddling the New Mexico and Texas border, which is the most interesting um, as far as the um, uh, federal government is concerned. And here's why. Um, this is a pretty stark uh, demonstration of, of how uh, federal government properties um, uh, are, are so much more significant in New Mexico than they are in, in Texas. And you can see how uh, this um, Delaware Basin in the southeast uh, portion of the state um, is, 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 has a lot of overlap with federal uh, leasing and federal properties. Uh, this is primarily the Bureau of Land Management that, that we're concerned with here. Um, contrast that to the state of Texas and, and its portion of the Delaware Basin. Um, it is entirely untouched by, by these policies. And in the Midland Basin, the same story goes. Um, there is um, some, you know, some significant differences in the acreage here. Uh, Delaware Basin has been uh, the fastest growing on a percentage basis over the last uh, several years. It is generally seen as more productive. But also these wells are, uh, have a higher gas cut than, than what we see in the, in the uh, Midland Basin. The royalty structure is much different between uh, these areas. Um, in the, the, the federal government, um, these uh, leases for onshore uh, have a, a comparatively low rate of 12.5% and it's been this way for decades. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion on raising that. It comes and goes every year, it seems. And I, I think that will be a focus of the discussion going forward as the government reviews leasing policy going forward. Um, university lands, which is probably the closest that Texas has to state-owned property. University lands are just the, um, it's the, the uh, Texas uh, public university um, mineral uh, royalty interest. Uh, that is a very high 25%. Um, and that is a, a, a very prominent um, uh, mineral right owner throughout the Midland Delaware Basin. Um, many companies that are in the uh, uh, Delaware Basin just accept the higher regulatory burden, which you know, is, is usually accompanied by much slower permitting times than what they would see in Texas uh, for this royalty rate. It's a bit of an incentive for them to, uh, to get in and, and be active here. It's also very uh, productive wells that we've seen over the last several years out of the, out of the Delaware Basin. So when we approach this study, uh, you know, as I've said, we focus this in, entirely on the Permian Basin. There are some takeaways for, uh, for other basins as well, um, but our focus was limited just to our neighborhood. And we did this how we do a lot of things here. Uh, we reached out to the stakeholders, uh, be it the oil and gas companies or the environmental groups, to, uh, to see, you know, this was all over the course of January and February, to see how they think this, these, this permitting pause and this um, uh, leasing review are going to shake out and how they would react to different scenarios. Um, so this led us to three uh, different cases to evaluate. Um, one was we had to come up with a, a, a reference case here uh, to base these other uh, scenarios against. And that this reference case is just assuming that uh, drilling and completion activity continues of what we were seeing uh, before. Um, that's not necessarily our base case forecast uh, in, internally uh, for the Permian Basin, but it's something for us to base our, our other scenarios against. Our hybrid case was we assume that federal oil and gas leasing ends, but drilling permits uh, on existing leases are issued. So drilling permits uh, last two years, more or less, with uh, federal government uh, properties, and um, they can be extended uh, on two years. These leases last 10 years. So we had a big bulge of, of leases um, over the last couple of years that are going to last you know, throughout the rest of the decade. 
And there was a question on whether or not, you know, coming out of the, the drilling pause or the, uh, the, the permitting pause, uh, one option for the federal government may be to no longer grant permit extensions uh, for, uh, for existing leases. Uh, that runs into some, uh, some debatable legal um, uh, parameters here that we didn't really get into with our study, but we just, you know, based on conversations with the stakeholders here, we did not assume that in this case that, um, that there would be, that, uh, we assume that existing leases will be able to get those extensions um, as needed. Um, and new permits will be granted to, to leases that don't currently have them. Um, the restrictive case, as we named it, was that those permits uh, are not extended and new permits are not issued on, on, existing, lease, or, or on existing leases. We also assume that there will be no more uh, new leases. So in both cases, we're assuming that there's no new lease auctions going forward. Um, that was just based off of the discussions on what the stakeholders are expecting and what they're preparing for. So we use we have a production model uh, here internally that we um, that we um, you know uh, tinkered with based off of these discussions uh, to to split between the states, which we weren't doing before. Um, the other thing we did was we we assume that permits on federal property are slowed. Uh, going forward, um, based off of just an expectation of there being a stricter level of scrutiny um, uh, put on these uh, permits going forward. And, you know, based off of these discussions, we, we had some companies who, who they had a lot of federal acreage, and they said, we are going to hit the gas and try to get a lot more uh, drilling done here while we can. We had others tell us, we're out of here, you know, we're, we're, we're moving our, our operations uh, into non-federal acreage. And so, there was, you know, a bit of internal debate on how we address that with, with, with trying to uh, show how the rigs and frat crews move between the states. And we, we came up with, with different uh, ratios for that, um, uh, for that movement, uh, which was key to, to how uh, these uh, production scenarios shook out. Uh, finally, to, to have some kind of an estimate on, on jobs. Uh, based on discussions with our industry contacts, we assume that there's around 240 workers on every uh, three well pad. And so uh, we focused our job impacts just on uh, that side of, of, of the industry. And we'll get into some of the reasons for that here in a moment. So how this shook out on uh, the Permian Basin as a whole. Um, our base case, we see you know, a pretty steady trajectory of increases uh, throughout the, until the end of 2025. Under the hybrid case, uh, which is where there's, there's no new leasing, but uh, permits continue to be granted, it was a slight uh, drop off of that, um, that, that base case. The restrictive case uh, saw a little bit more on the order of 490,000 barrels per day uh, that would uh, uh, be gone at the end of this forecast period versus our base case. And so what kind of struck out to us is we're not seeing uh, on the Permian Basin as a whole a a rollover in production because of what would possibly happen on federal acreage here. However, what the more interesting part to us was to look under the hood. And what we saw was a pretty significant difference between what happens in Texas and New Mexico. Uh, in New Mexico, we did see that rollover relatively quickly in, in uh, total production out of, out of the state, um, uh, on the uh, total Permian production out of, out of New Mexico. Um, it left unchanged, it continues to grow, though obviously at a much slower pace than what we were seeing uh, before the pandemic. Um, under the hybrid case, it starts to roll over towards the middle of, uh, of next year. And, but interestingly, it begins to stabilize um, uh, throughout the forecast period. Under the restrictive case, where no new leases are granted, um, it, it is a, a pretty dramatic drop um, um, uh, across the, uh, the, the basin on the order of 900,000 barrels a day um, uh, versus where it would have been over the forecast period. So contrast that to the state of Texas and these, um, uh, or the Permian Basin in Texas, and the scenarios are flipped. The worse that it looks for New Mexico, the better it looks for, for Texas. Though, uh, you know, th this, uh, this chart is at the same scale. It's showing that it's, um, you know, not as clear of, or not as big of a benefit as it is a negative for, uh, for the state of New Mexico as far as the production goes. 
And then again, this is driven entirely by uh, the amount of rigs and, and crews that move across state borders over time uh, to capture uh, the, the opportunity that would lie in Texas versus New Mexico. So the employment picture here, again, um, is focused entirely on the field level uh, wor workers. And um, we see a, a, a larger benefit in employment uh, to Texas than it is a negative in, in New Mexico. Uh, but this does not include a lot of the other services that, that would, would occur here. So you know, the tank batteries and the gathering lines that would need to be laid. Obviously there's an employment impact here that we did not uh, address in this. Um, it would, you know, just for the purposes of our blog, um, which are generally, you know, somewhat short and for the general public, we didn't get into this. It is something that we may address later on though. And the overall impact for, you know, just due to the industry's multiplier effect uh, would be quite uh, you know, significant. Uh, versus what these uh, figures look like um, on the field level. So the other impacts here, the, potentially the most significant one is on state revenues, um, where a third of New Mexico's state budget is derived from oil and gas industry. And this is directly from the industry, not from um, associated impacts uh, in economic activity from it. Um, again, as I said before, 50-50 of the, the royalties and bonus bids come from um, uh, it, it split 50%, the federal government um, uh, acreage here in the state. And there would be a significant loss there going forward that the state would have to address um, some way. In, you know, we don't offer an answer there. But interestingly, when we look at these different uh, production scenarios, you can see how under the hybrid scenario where production uh, tends to roll over and, um, and level off over the out years, um, it, you would see some stability, though, at a lower um, uh, level, of, you know, coming from these royalties and taxes and fees coming from the industry in New Mexico. Um, you know, on the environmental side, um, there's a potentially large um, impact here, uh, just, you know, primarily through the truck trips. You know, if you've spent any time in the Permian Basin or have lived out there, this is a significant issue for residents out there. Um, based on industry contact discussion, it's about 1,200 heavy truck trips that are involved with every single three-well pad. So you know that loss of activity in New Mexico as it shifts into uh, Texas, there would be a, 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 a significant shift in this type of, of a road traffic and the damage that it does uh, to the roads. It's such a perpetual complaint among many residents. Uh, interestingly, uh, on the flaring side of this, uh, New Mexico is, is in the process of implementing uh, some much more stringent flaring rules uh, for the oil and gas sector than what Texas has, and, and it's something that Texas is, um, is uh, unlikely to address aggressively uh, in our estimation in the near term. So if you're shifting more activity into Texas at the expense of New Mexico, it could shift more flaring activity into New Mexico. Um, though we expect it would be a somewhat marginal uh, case. Uh, the downstream impacts here, uh, Gulf, Stream, uh, Gulf Coast refineries um, uh, really have bulked up their appetite for uh, light and ultralight crude uh, coming out of the Permian Basin over the last several years. These were long-term billion dollar investments um, that they would have to replace um, you know, from uh, overseas imports, uh, mainly from West Africa and the Moravian Gulf. Um, you know, conversely, you know, there's also been a lot of export capacity that has been um, built up over the last uh, decade to uh, to send to primarily Southeast Asia, South Korea, to uh, South Amer America, where there is appetite for uh, these light and super light uh, grades. And those uh, import market export markets would have to replace these inputs from uh, competitive markets as well. So in the future, what we're watching is, you know, really this all rests on how do uh, how does a fossil fuel uh, leasing uh, review wind up? What are we? What's the federal government going to do here? Uh, this was this entire study was based off of what people, you know, our our, our um, industry contacts are expecting and, and what we foresee as possible uh, scenarios here. We haven't seen those yet, and it's going to be many months, uh, if not till later in the uh, much later in the year, that we that we know for sure what policies will emerge, and then we can go back and, and address our our study again. 
Uh, another you know, significant question is if royalty rates are, are, are increased, which I think most uh, people are expecting, how is that gonna impact the, the economics of the Delaware Basin and a lot of these producers that rely on that, that value proposition to, to be really active out there? Um, how much are, is, it, you know, it, it all depends on how much the royalty rate is increased and how, how much does that shift their behavior? So on the other end of this, um, if there is less activity but higher royalty rates, you know, does that make whole uh, this proposition of, of how much the state of New Mexico takes uh, out of royalty uh, revenue. And then finally, we did this study in a $50 to $60 WTI world, and we're approaching, you know, we're knocking on the $65 to $70 world. Now, we fully understand how most large public companies have, have um, adopted this, uh, you know, much more disciplined style of, of, of how they are, are um, unrolling CapEx dollars going forward, saying that they're not going to uh, drill more at higher prices, they're committing more to dividends, but that's not necessarily the case for most private operators and most, many of the smaller ones. Um, if we do you know, start to uh, settle into this price environment now, how much does that change uh, these CapEx plans? How much does that change field activity? And how much would that change the scenarios that we are uh, looking at in our study? And it's something that we'll just address uh, as we move forward here throughout the year. So that was the long and short of, of what we were trying to do with this study and uh, really happy to answer any of your questions on it going forward through the rest of our time. Okay, now uh, Doug. Uh... All right, you're gonna put the video back on me or you want me to just read the uh, questions off as is right now? There, you're, you're on, Michael. Okay, great. So Garrett, we have uh, three outstanding questions here. <clears throat> um, so what I'll do is I'll just read them in, in the order that I see them. And if you aren't sure you can answer them, then of course what we can do is follow up um, with the, the <clears throat> person asking the question. So the first one comes from Brian Prest. Brian, been a while, hope you're doing good. So the question here is, you mentioned that you found that leasing restrictions would create more open parentheses, direct jobs, close parentheses in Texas than would be lost in New Mexico, meaning the restrictions create jobs in aggregate. Could you elaborate on what leads to this result? Well, so it's, it's really a function of the, the baseline that we're starting at. There, there, there are many more rigs and crews operating in Texas right now than there are in, the, well, not a lot more, but there are more in Texas and New Mexico, Texas than there are in New Mexico. So that incremental shift um, is, um, is, uh, is, is a bit, um, I think can be explained by, by that. I don't know if I'm explaining it, um, you know, the, the most clear way, um, but, um, you know, there, uh, when we uh, when we see the um, the amount of crews that we in rigs that we were already expecting to increase over this forecast period, and then you add on top what would go um, from the ship from New Mexico to Texas, it ends up being, you know, as you point out, a, a, a net positive. But it, it's not. Um, I mean, it it, it is kind of counterintuitive in the way that you describe it because you know you're you're talking about. Um, um, uh, you know, a, a regulation that crimps jobs ostensibly, but at the same time is net creating more. It's just based off of what we were assuming the level of increase already would have been uh, in Texas. Thanks, Garrett. So the next question comes from Andrew Slaughter. So he asked, did you model natural gas production as well as oil? Because you said that Delaware is more gas rich. Is the downside for natural gas bigger? Uh, we did not get into that. Um, we, we don't do a whole lot of natural gas modeling um, internally unless it, it, it has been requested. And also, you know, you know part of the, the I mean, I, I think the blog is a great product and, and it's, um, it's really good for reaching the general population, but we also have to focus a lot of our work very narrowly. And so we only focus on the oil side of this for this uh, report. Okay, thanks, Garrett. Well, that is an interesting question, actually, about how that might play out with the uh, the natural gas side of things, giving 
some of the issues they've had with pipeline capacity in the past. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we looked at it from that perspective just initially, uh, you, know, to, you know, sorry for forgetting that second part of the question, um, because, you know, just what we've seen of the, um, the gas pipeline constraints over the last several years, we wanted to see if that was a potential issue. And because there was such a, a loss in, in, uh, in production and activity over the last year, we're not expecting there to be a, a, a crunch on uh, pipeline capacity going forward, just looking at it from a, a, a very high level. And so that was part of the reason why we didn't dig into it. On the other side, more gas capture because of um, uh, flaring regulations going forward in New Mexico, uh, you know, does change that on the mar margin. But again, we didn't dig into it that deeply. Okay, thanks. Could be a future blog. So I'll, I'll take the final question, or I think it's the final question, uh, from Tom Russo. So have you shared your paper with the uh, BLM and the administration regarding the environmental and social impacts in New Mexico and Texas? If not, do you think that they are aware of this and will factor these issues into the NEPA reviews? Um, no, we do not. Um, we, we have not, you know, forwarded it along to any anybody within the administration. Um, and I, I don't think we usually operate uh, that way. You know, we, we, wanna, we wanna put out our studies and our information when they do you know, you know, cross into this, you know, polit these political questions like this, we have to be very careful because that's not really our intent to shift or, 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 um, or um, you know, advocate for or against anything. Um, we have seen where, you know, our study has been um, you know, cited in house hearings or, or, or whatnot. So we think that it's on their radar, um, but it's not some, you know, we put it out there on the blog and distributed it through our email list. And that's as far as we go, as far as uh, trying to uh, get the word out on what our studies uh, suggest. Okay, fourth question has come in. Let me go down to this. Um, from Charles Mason. So he just asks if there is a more detailed document than the blog that's available, but I, I don't believe there is, right, Garrett? No, there's not. Uh, we, we, we post, you know, the, the, the data for our charts uh, that are on the blog, but there's not, you know, this isn't part of, a, of an ongoing working paper that we'll publish um, uh, later on or, or a synopsis of something larger that we've already done. Uh, it just may be something that we address again or review again uh, as we have more information in the future. Yes, now if, if anyone in the audience wants to ask more specifics about what's in the blog, so first go take a look at the blog and then email Garrett and right. he, can, uh, help he can help you have a deeper conversation about any of those issues if that's something you're interested in. Okay, so that looks to be it. Any, any last questions from anyone out there in the audience? Okay, if not, um, Doug, I think that's it for us. Should I uh, provide a short conclusion or do you want to handle that? I, if you have any, any other further comments, Michael, please go right ahead. No, I just want to say thanks for, to everyone for uh, coming in and watching the webinar. Hope you found something interesting in there and something that was useful. And like I said, uh, if you have any questions, there is, as Garrett mentioned, there's a blog that's online and you're happy, you should feel free to reach out to Garrett with uh, questions if you wanna get into some more details. And that's, that's, all I'll leave, that's all I'll say. Okay. And I want to thank both you, Michael and Garrett, uh, especially for the presentation today. Uh, thanks to all our attendees and for your participation. Again, this webinar will be available on our website uh, in a couple of days if anybody wants to come back to view it. And we do appreciate it. Take care, have a good rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.